If you would, turn in your Bibles this morning back to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We began last week with verse 19 and taught through verses 19 and 20. I am going to read this morning down through verse 24. And if you would please stand as we read through this particular passage of Scripture. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, The Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges No one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. May God bless his word. You may be seated. So if you remember, as we were speaking here last week, as we got into this particular section of Scripture, this was, of course, following the healing of this invalid man that had been an invalid for 38 years. And Jesus healed him on the Sabbath day. And that the Jews, primarily, I believe, the leaders of the Jews were upset that Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And of course, if you read the uh, book of Deuteronomy and some of the other Old Testament scriptures, you understand that acts of mercy were allowed on the Sabbath day. Those were allowed. Uh, but if, we, if you remember when we were teaching through this, that the Pharisees and the scribes had instituted Uh, additional, I think it was 39 additional rules, a list of rules of what you could not do on the Sabbath day, going beyond what God the Father had taught. But they were upset that he had done this. And then, of course, then he said, my father is working down in uh, the latter part of that that context of that scripture, down in verse 17, my father is working until now and I am working And this is what really made them angry, that he was, of course, equating himself with the Father, that he was deity, that he was uh, uh, the same essence of the Father. And so it says then, of course, that this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he, at least in their eyes, (laughs) but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. So for those that said that Jesus never claimed to be God, they don't know what they're talking about. Because certainly he was making himself of equal standing with God. And so instead of backing off of that, what did Jesus do? Well, he spoke on that day and we talked about the truly, truly statement. Amen, amen, which is to really verify, to give an authoritative stamp that this is truth. And we said that this phrase is used 25 times in the book of John. So when that particular wording is used, we need to pay special attention to what that says, that this is absolute truth that Jesus is speaking. As he said, when he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And other passages uh, that we saw in the scriptures throughout the book of John. And so he speaks there and Jesus is showing here his submission to the Father. Even though the Father and he are one. Even though he and the Father are both deity. When he was in his earthly ministry here. Submitted himself to the will of the Father. And as I said before that's an example for us. That we should submit ourselves to the will of the Father. Now much of that is what I spoke of was what is revealed, the revealed will of the Father. When we see, thus saith the Lord in the scriptures, or we see these things, we talk about the different ways that the Greek is used. When we see an imperative, 
than in the scriptures, in the Greek, then we are to pay attention to that. We are to be obedient to that. That is the Father's will. That is the will of the scriptures, God's will. And so what we see here is his submission to the Father. What the Father does, he says, that the Son does also. Whatever he sees the Father doing, that he does also. And then he says in greater works, he says the Father loves the Son. And when we think about that, we are talking about an eternal love. Now for us, we have a beginning. There's a moment in time in which every one of us was born. And we have eternal life now. We possess eternal life now. It is ours now. It's not that I'm going to have eternal life when I die, but I have eternal life now from the moment of my salvation as a child of God. But here we see when the foot says the Father loves the Son, that is an eternal, He is without beginning, without end. The, the Trinity is without beginning, without end. There is that intimate love that the Father has for the Son that He has had for all of eternity. But in His humiliation, in His humbleness, He came to this earth and He clothed Himself in the flesh. He submitted Himself to the Father. He says, I do only those things that my Father shows me and tells me to do. And when He said later on in John, I and my Father are one, they are one in essence, but they are also one in purpose, one in power. And this is what we are seeing here in this is that Jesus is illustrating and teaching these Jewish leaders who were the, like the blind leading the blind. Here I am. I and my Father are one. We are of the same essence. We are of the same purpose. We are of the same creative power. We are of the same holiness and righteousness. We are the same. And they do not differ in any Point in time, think about this, that they have never differed at any point in time on anything throughout eternity. And so he says greater works than these. And what he's speaking back are to those things that what he's, he's just done. You've seen this where I've made this man who's been lame or invalid for 38 years and has not been able to get down to these waters here but he says you're going to see greater works than these if you're amazed at this just wait there's more coming there's greater coming and so then leads up to what I'm going to say today that was a long introduction <laughs> and background four you know these little words are important four there's a connection here between verse 20 and verse 21 this connects these and the marveling, what he says here, greater works and the marveling at these works by men as the Father raises the dead and gives them life. Now let's stop and think about that for a moment. What is revealed here in this verse is the power of God, the authority of God in giving life. Now we talked about the creation before. You have the Father, you have the Son, you have the Spirit. You see all of that. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. You look at Colossians chapter 1 and it speaks there of the Son speaking all that is, that all that has life into being. Ex nihilo. Out of nothing in that. And so where did life come from? It says He raises the dead and gives them life. And what is revealed in this verse is the power of God in giving life. All life, let me say this, is from God. I'm going to make a statement here that is going to be taken probably by some people politically. Abortion is wrong because God gave that life. He is the authority over life. He gives life. He gives life sovereignly, both in the physical realm and in the spiritual realm, both. There is a purpose for every life that is conceived. And so what 
he is saying here, and what I believe that Jesus is saying is that physical and spiritual life and the power and the authority that is inherent in that is an evidence of deity. It is an evidence of deity. No one can stop this power. No one can hinder that power. If we believe that he is almighty God and that Jesus is almighty, then by the word of his power all things were created and life was given. That originates there. That is an evidence of deity. And that's what he is saying here. It is an evidence of the deity. And he has a purpose in saying this. And it says here, if you notice, whom he will. Whom he will. He gives spiritual life to whom he will. He is sovereign in salvation. He is sovereign in that. And if you look in both the Old and the New Testament, when you talk about life and the, and the power of God and the giving of life, it speaks of the Father's sovereignty in these things. If you want to look over with me, I'm going to look at Deuteronomy and read for you Deuteronomy chapter 32. Chapter 32 and verse 9, 39, excuse me, 32 and 39. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. What is he saying in that? It means exactly what it says. I kill. I end life. There's a time for all of us that we come into this world and we die. He has ordained the point of our life beginning. He has ordained the point of our death in that. But he does that. In the book of Romans, this time chapter 4, verse 17. It's speaking here about Abraham and the promise to Abraham. You go back up, up here to verse 16. I'm going to begin there. That is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead. And calls into existence the things that do not exist. God himself, he says here. He says he gives life to the dead. To those that are dead and trespasses and sins. God gives life. He gave life, spiritual life to Abraham. Abraham was no different than any of those other idol worshipers where he lived in Haran. God just said, Abraham, I'm going to give you life. And he gave him life. In chapter 8 of Romans, and there in verse 11, let me begin with verse 10 again. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, you realize that we are before salvation, we are dead spiritually because of sin. The spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, that being God the Father, dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now one of these days I already possess eternal life. Right now as I've already said. And one day this body is going to die. And with this spirit is going to go be with God the Father and the Son in heaven. But this body is going to be in the grave. But one day when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again, he is going to resurrect this physical body and transform it into a glorious body. He will give life to it. He's already given me spiritual life, but this body here that dies is going to be resurrected out of the grave as God the Father raised Jesus out of the grave. 
So, then what does he say? So likewise here, what does he say? For as the Father raises the dead and he gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Do you see what he's doing here? He is saying the Father gives life to whom he will, but also I give life to whom I will. I do that. Why? Because I and my Father are one. We are the same. We are the same in the authority and the power over death. We are the same with the authority and the power to give life. We are sovereign in that. And here's what he's saying. As the Father does that, so do I. Why? Because I am also God. I am also deity. I also possess that same power. He has that power of giving life to those who are dead, both physically and spiritually. I'm going to just stick here in regards to this to some scriptures in John. Look back, if you would, for a moment back to John 4 and Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman. He's having this conversation. We're not going to go back all through this. But in verse 10, he says, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you what? Living water. What he's saying here is he would have given you life. You go down to verse 14 here. But whoever, he can literally read verse 13 also. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water is going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What is he saying to that Samaritan woman? I give life. And later on, We don't know exactly when it was, but he gave her life. You remember the story. She left her water pot. She went into the city. She went and told people about Jesus. You see, that's what I'll say this again. That's why God gives us life. It's not just so we can say, oh, well, praise God, I'm not going to hell. No, he gives us life so that we may be able to tell others about the giver of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, he is sovereign in this, but he gives us the blessing of being able to be a partaker in that. Like as Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. He calls us, He saves us so that we might be able to tell them of He who gives the water of life and who gives eternal life and everlasting life. And He goes over in chapter 6 of John and verse 27. He says there, do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him what God the Father has set his seal. He is the one giving life. And he says, I give life here. The Son of Man will give it to you, this food that endures to eternal life. As the Father gives life, I give life. And then in verses 39 and 40 of that same chapter. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up. What on the last day? Give life then. For this is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have what? Eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. I love the I wills of the Father and the Son. I will. I will. I will do this. This is a promise. This is a promise that I give to you that I will do this. But what we're illustrating here is he has that same power and authority to give life. That's why I tell people if you're here this morning and you're without life, guess what? I know who gives life. And you call upon him who gives life. 
Just like old blind Bartimaeus. I know I've used him as an illustration before, but he was by the roadside begging. And he said, Son of David, have mercy on me. And that's what you do as one outside of Christ. If you do not have life, you call upon him while he may be found. You may not have tomorrow. You may not have an hour from now. You call upon him who possesses life. And then in John chapter 10, and there in verse 28, I give them, well, look, I, I can't skip verse 27. I can't skip that one. It's one, one of my favorite songs that we sing. We hadn't sung that one in a while out of the chorus book. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them. I give them, he says. I give them eternal life, and they will what? Never perish. Praise God, Brother Chester. Never, ever, absolutely, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I give them eternal life. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Praise God, we have that promise. But you see what Jesus is doing here. He is saying to the Jews, the same one that you say that you believe in, which they really didn't, (laughs) God the Father, the same one that raises the dead and gives life, guess what? I do the same thing. I am the same. And then what you see as a visible demonstration of his authority is just a few chapters down here in, in John. In John chapter 11, We see Jesus standing by the grave of Lazarus. And he's been dead long enough now that when he tells them to roll the stone away, they're saying, Jesus, you don't really want to do that. He's stinking by this point in time. Let's just be honest. There was no uh, embalming in those days, at least not in Israel. He said, roll that stone away. What does he say? Verses 43 through 46. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Come out. The man who had died came out. His hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Man, I love that. Let him go. Take off those old death rags and let him go. It says there that many of the Jews therefore who had come with Mary and had seen what he did believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Now let me say this. Not everybody that saw the miracles of Jesus as we've talked about believed in him unto salvation. They hardened their heart against that. They hardened their heart against those things. But he demonstrated here his authority over physical life to substantiate, I have that authority to give life. And there were other places. Lazarus wasn't the only one that was raised from the dead. I'm not going to turn to these, but if you know about the daughter of of Jairus, and the widow uh, of, the, uh, of Nain, her son, also in, in Luke 7 and in, in Luke 8. And so these works, these miracles of giving life caused people to marvel and gave evidence of his deity. What you see later on in verses 9 through 11 there of John 12 is even though he had raised the dead, the Jews, the leaders still hated him. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, also to see Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. What dark, sinful Wicked hearts to see this great miracle of the work of God and yet say, oh, we need to kill this man that he raised from the dead because, whoa, we're losing our power. 
We're being threatened. But what it is illustrating here is it is illustrating and demonstrating the truth concerning spiritual life that it is God's authority and power that does this. It is His authority. It made me think of when we first began teaching from John verses 12 and 13 there in chapter 1. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then John 6 and verses 63 and 64. What did Jesus say? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help. And all the words that I speak unto you, or I have spoken unto you, are spirit and life there. That's what he says. That's what he taught. And Ephesians 2 and verse 1 talks about that, that we were dead in trespasses and sins, but he quickened us. He gave us life. You see, we did not make ourselves alive. There's not one person in this room tonight that could say while they were still dead in trespasses and sins, well, I'm going to see if I can give myself spiritual life. No, you can't do that. You don't have the power. You don't have the authority. But God in his mercy, who is rich in mercy, chooses to give life. He chooses to give life. We did not generate our own life in Christ. It is a sovereign work of God as he shows here. Then in verse 22, again he says here, The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. So now what Jesus is doing is equating his authority, his rightful place to judge sin and sinners as the Father does. That they are the same in the area of the judgment of men, of whether or not they are right before God. You see, all of us are going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the truth of Scripture. That is the teaching of Scripture. And we're all going to give an account. And the Father has committed Him to be the judge. Now, could the Father judge? Absolutely. And He does judge. We have seen that throughout the Old Testament. You see the Father judging. And the Jews knew and understood that the Father, at least they had been taught in the Old Testament Scriptures, that He is the one that judges because He is absolutely righteous and holy. You know, look at Psalm 9. I'm just going to read a few passages of Scripture here that illustrates this. Psalm, chapter, Psalm 9 and verses 7 and 8. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established His throne for justice. And He judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. Then in chapter, in Psalm 37 and verse 28. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake His saints. They are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. So what is the psalmist David teaching here? That God judges. Now we don't, people will say sometimes, well, that's, judgment is just an Old Testament concept. But that's not what Jesus is saying here, that there's still going to be a judgment. The justice of God is going to be meted out. It is going to be, he's going to be the judge. And what he is saying here is that the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. He has given the right of judgment to the Son. If you go over to the book of Acts, and you don't have to turn there, but let me read this for you. If you want to write it down, that's fine. In chapter 10 of Acts, and there in verse 42, what is there? He commanded us. 
to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. What is it saying there? That God the Father has appointed the Son who came and died upon the cross to judge the, the, the living and the dead. When he comes again, he will judge all. He's been appointed to that. That is his place. In other words, his right and authority to the judge, as we see here, and to judge, is because he is deity. He is God himself. He has that right. And the Father has handed that right of judgment over to him. He wouldn't hand that right of judgment over to you or to me because our judgment and our system that we might have justice that we have in our mind is not perfect, but his is perfect. Because he is holy and righteous. And so is God the Father in authority and absolute righteousness and holiness judges so the Son in his authority and absolute holiness has the right to judge also. So as the Father, as he's showing this oneness for the Father, the Son and the Father are the same in power to give life and to raise the dead. They are the same also in the area of judgment. Jesus revealed this right in his teachings. Back over in the book of Matthew, verses 21 through 23, Jesus in his teachings said this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Now that's a somber, let me say this. This is a somber passage of scripture. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's why the scripture admonishes us, if you'll let me take a little aside here, to examine ourselves. To make sure that we are in the faith. There should be an all, we should, there should be a constant spiritual self-examination that we have. We don't say we're going to pass from judgment just because we've repeated a prayer. We are going to examine ourselves to make sure that we are walking in the ways of the word of God and bearing spiritual fruit and being obedient to the faith. But he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one what who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Are you doing the will of God? You say, well, how do I know whether I'm doing the will of God? Again, the revealed will of God. This is the will of God, what? Your sanctification. Now, that's a, that, that's a sore subject with many people, is the doctrine of practical sanctification. And unfortunately, not many churches are very heavy on the teaching of practical sanctification. But are you living a holy life? Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's the will of God. Do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is the will of God. It is the will of God that you bear spiritual fruit. Those that abide in Him, He says, are going to bear fruit. We're to bear fruit for the glory of God, but also as an evidence to others of our salvation. As it says, let me finish that passage there. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And didn't we cast out demons in your name? And didn't we do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. What he is saying is there is that he is going to be the one judging whether we hold up to the standard of righteousness in the word of God. Are you clothed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you clothed in the righteous robes of the Lord Jesus? Jesus Christ. He will be the one that judges. And then again, farther on in Matthew's gospel, there in verse, in chapter 24 and verse 30, he says, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Why are they mourning? Because here comes the judge. Here comes the righteous, the holy judge. And they will cry out for the rocks and the mountains and the hills to fall upon them because they know I will not stand right in his eyes. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. 
And you can go over one more chapter. Verse 31 in chapter 25 of Matthew. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations and He will separate people from one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and He will place the sheep on His right but the goats on His left. There's going to be a separation one day. You're either going to be on the right or you're going to be on the left. You realize I'm just saying that figuratively. I'm not saying you folks over here on the left are spiritually on the left. We're on my right. <laughs> you see, but he's, there's going to be a separation. There's going to be a judgment on that day. And you go on down. I'm going to skip a lot of this. You can read all of this if you would desire later. But in verse 41, what it says, he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Then in verse 46, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. There is going to be a judgment, there's going to be a separation, and the one who is going to do this, who has, has every right and authority and holiness to do this, is the Lord Jesus Christ. For those that are on the right, for those that are righteous, they will love His appearing. But for those outside of Christ, they will dread His appearing. Because they know, they will know that they will not stand the test of the judgment. And Peter proclaims this truth by quoting, we read this morning from Psalm 2. And there's a quotation in, in Peter's Great sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And there in verses 34 and 35. What does he say there? For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, and what that really means in the Hebrew translation, Jehovah said to Adonai. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now let that sink in for a minute. And imagine you're one of those thousands that were there on that day and that you were one of the ones crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And by the Holy Spirit and the power of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, those chills start running down your spine and that terror comes over your soul and said, Oh, I have crucified the one who is to be my judge. And they cried out, Brothers, what shall we do? And he said, Repent. Be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what the sinner needs to do this morning. What must I do? What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be right with He who is to judge? You repent. You call on the name of the Lord for mercy. And Paul declares it also. If you go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, there in verse 1, I charge you here in the presence of God, Paul says, and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. That there's coming a time of judgment in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And there in verses 7 and 8, And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, there is a day coming in which all will give account, which all will bow the knee. And to finish this up quickly here, what he says, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. 
Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. There's no split authority here. There's no saying, well, I, I choose the Father, but I don't choose the Son. I love the Father, but I don't love the Son. I, don't, I accept God the Father as God, but I don't accept Jesus as God. No. To not love one is to not love the other. In 1 John chapter 2, there in verses 23 and 24, this same John that wrote this book says this in regards to this. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And then in chapter 5 of this same book, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. You see, if you love the Son, if you really have agape love, you love the Father. If you have agape love, you love the Father. You love the Son. You adore both of them. You desire for both of them. You want to be with both of them. And this was a message to the Jews that if they did not honor the Son or believe in the Son, they did not have favor with God. They did not have a right standing with God. He said, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear Him. Listen to him. And here's what he's saying. I again and my father, we are one. We are the same. And this belief in the son must be more than just an intellectual acknowledgement of Christ. It's not enough just to say, well, yes, I believe that Jesus came and he was a good man and he did some good deeds, but I don't really believe that he was God. You're not going to heaven. You're not going to heaven. The only way that you're going to go to heaven is to believe in the Son, God's only begotten Son, eternal Son of God for all eternity who put upon Himself flesh and humbled Himself and became the sacrifice for sinners, became and is the eternal Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. He must be believed in. Must. Must. I am the way and the truth and the life. Somebody might say, well, I don't believe that. As nicely as I can say it, you know, whether you agree with what he said or not does not change the fact that your eternal destiny lies in whether or not you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether or not He is your Lord and Savior. He came that a sinner like me might be saved. And I might have it life and have it more abundantly. And He's coming again. As the judge of all the earth. And the best way that I know how to end this message is to read Philippians chapter 2. And verses 9 through 11. Therefore, God, the Father, has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Have you called on him? Do you name him as your Lord? Does your tongue confess that he is your Lord and Savior? I pray that you do. And if he is not, then again, call upon him while he may be found. May we pray.